This is a story from when I was a third-year university student. As summer vacation approached, five of my university friends and I decided to plan a trip to the beach. During the planning stage, one of our friends suggested that we should work at a hotel during our trip. Since I didn't have any specific plans for the summer vacation, I agreed without hesitation. However, two of our friends later realized that they had a seminar camp or something similar and couldn't make it to the trip. As a result, three out of the five of us decided to work at a hotel, and the remaining two would stay at the inn where we would be working as a part of our trip later temporarily. So first, in order to find a suitable place to work, the three of us divided tasks and started searching around. During our work period at the inn, apart from regular days off, I requested two additional days off to meet up with friends. The response was cheerful. You have to work extra for those days, all right? And then the day came for the three of us, including myself, to set up for the inn. It was our first living job at an inn, so we were quite excited and nervous. The inn was two-story, fairly spacious guest house. In short, it felt like my grandmother has in the countryside. Although it had inn written on the sign, it was more like a guest house. When we called out the entrance, a young girl greeted us with a smile. My excitement soared at the moment. Inside of the inn, there were four guest rooms, one communal dining room, and two rooms for living staff, making a total of seven rooms. We were initially directed to the dining room. After a while, a young girl named Misaki brought us barley tea. She was a local girl from this town where the inn was located. Along with her, the landlady, Makiko, came in. She had a plump figure and a hearty laugh, a very nice person. If she were a bit younger, I might have fallen for her. Her husband was also there. So there were six of us in total who would be running this guest house. After some introductions and conversation, the landlady said, The guest rooms are at the end of the corridor to your right as your sleeping quarters are at the end of the left corridor. After you put your stuff away, we'll explain everything. For now, take it easy. One day, my friend, let's call him A, had a question. Are guest rooms on the second floor? Makiko replied with a smile. No, they're not. We're not using the second floor right now. We didn't pay much attention to it at first, thinking maybe it wasn't the season yet or they'd open up later. We went to our rooms, unpacked, and looked at the views from the window, feeling a sense of peace. Despite the upcoming hard work during our job, we felt it was worth to spend the summer in such a beautiful place. We were also looking forward to the adventures of the summer. And so our job at the inn began. There were challenging moments, but since everyone was friendly, it wasn't a burden at all. It made me realize that the workplace is all about relationships. Around a week later, one of my friends said, You know, we found a great place to work, didn't we? Another friend chimed in. Yeah, and we are making a good amount of money too. As we discussed this, I added, True, but isn't that busy season coming up soon? A then asked, By the way, when the season starts, will they open up the second floor? B replied. I doubt it. Maybe the landlady and her family live on the second floor? A and I simultaneously said, Is that so? B continued. I'm not sure. But haven't you noticed that the landlady often takes a foot upstairs recently? A and I said, I don't know. B explained that he often saw the landlady carrying food to the second floor while doing the evening cleaning in front of the entrance. The landlady would take a tray of food and quietly go up the stairs to the second floor. We heard this information with casual curiosity and didn't think much of it. A few days later, on a typical day when I was cleaning the hallway, I saw it, the landlady sneaking out of one of the guest rooms. The landlady generally doesn't do things like cleaning rooms that's all handled by Misaki. So it made it even more suspicious, I guess. At first, I couldn't believe my eyes, but it was definitely the landlady. I had been carrying a lot on my mind that day, 
So in the end, I couldn't keep quiet and told my friends. A said, "I've seen that too." I asked, "Seriously? Why didn't you say anything?" B added, "I've never seen that." I said, "Then just stay quiet." A, B, and I discussed whether we should bring this up. We had almost a month left in our job, and if things continued peacefully, it would be enjoyable. However, being young and adventurous, we felt the need to investigate. So we decided to observe quietly and report any suspicious activities. The next evening, B called us into our shared room with a sense of urgency. B said. Guys, remember how I told you about the landlady going upstairs frequently? Well, I was until the end yesterday. She usually goes up the stairs, but yesterday I waited until she came down. A asked, and then? B continued, we often have the meals with the landlady, right? But she carried food upstairs in a tray during dinner. That means someone must be living up there, right? I added, "Well, it's a possibility." Be further explained, but we've never seen anyone suspicious, and we've never even heard a peep from up there. A said, "It's strange, but maybe it's someone ill or something." B replied, "That's what I thought too. But eating a full meal in just five minutes—that seems pretty healthy, doesn't it?" A said, "I guess so." We found it a bit eerie. What could be on the second floor? We were all filled with curiosity. The next day, we finished our regular tasks early, and gathered at the entrance where B was stationed. We waited for the landlady to appear. After a while, she came out with a tray of food and went upstairs, just as B had mentioned. She disappeared into the distance. Just to clarify, the staircase leading to the second floor was outside, near the entrance. We couldn't see the stairs going from the first floor indoors to the second floor. We cautiously followed her, opened the door along the wall, and found a staircase. We went up the stairs. For now, we wanted to know what was happening on the second floor. Hey, it's pretty quick, isn't it? Yeah, it definitely is. What do you think is up there? I don't know. Want to check it out? Honestly, I'm kind of freaked out right now. Me too. Well, let's go take a look. So we said that and headed to the door leading to the second floor with a staircase. A said, "Is it locked or something?" Despite A's concern, I turned the doorknob and it opened easily with a click. As the door opened a few inches from B's position on the left, he could just barely see inside. Hmm. B grimaced and pinched his nose. What's wrong? I and A didn't understand, but B was strongly reacting to some smell. Are you kidding? A seemed annoyed and scared, but B was dead serious. No, seriously, don't you smell it? If you open the door wider, you'll notice. I made up my mind and quickly opened the door. Warm air flowed out along with a cloud of dust. Do you mean this dusty smell? Oh wait, it doesn't smell anymore. Hey, stop joking around at a time like this. I swear, if anything happens, I'm leaving you behind. I've decided that now. A was trembling with fear. Sorry, but I really smell something strange. It was like a garbage smell. Enough already. It's just your imagination. While A and B were bickering, I noticed something peculiar. The hallway was incredibly narrow, just wide enough for one person to pass. There didn't seem to be any light fixtures, and we could barely make out the staircase at the end of the corridor, thanks to the eternal light. At the end of the stairs, there was another door. Hey, looks like only one person can go up. No way, we're not going up there. Are you going up? Well, it seems like it's up to me then. A and B were reluctant. Seriously, you're really going up? I'm the type who can't sleep if something bothers me. The type who would come alone in the middle of the night if I couldn't sleep. It's a damn dangerous and scary, right? 
so I'm going now. It wasn't an explicable reason, but considering my curiosity, it seems better to check it out while A and B were present. However, my curiosity was matched by a sense of fear. For now, I was the only one who would go, but we agreed that if an emergency arose, A and B would not abandon me, and they would inform someone immediately. However, if nothing happened, they were not to suddenly shout or scream. I made it clear that if they did, I couldn't guarantee their safety, so I slowly began climbing the stairs alone. Stairs were dimly lit by the outside light, creating an eerie atmosphere. I began to carefully climb the stairs one step at a time. However, halfway up, I started hearing the sounds like crack, crack. Worried about what might be causing it, I turned around, frightened, to check on my two companions. What's wrong? Do you smell that? Smell what? I nodded slightly and turned back towards the second floor. I dismissed the sounds as typical creaking that often occurs in the old houses. When I realized that lower entrance light didn't reach very far up the stairs, a balance between curiosity and fear started to shift, and I felt an overwhelming desire to turn and run back down. As I peered into the darkness, my mind began to conjure thoughts like, "What if there's something standing in front of the door?" That's when my tendency to think, "What if?" in situations like this started to kick in. Crack, crack, crack. The sounds became more intense, and、I、had a strange feeling like I was stepping on something. I thought it might be bags, and shuddered at the thought. But there was no visible movement. And the darkness prevented me from confirming anything. I must have turned around several times, and at some point, I noticed that the silhouettes of A and B below were now appearing as faint shadows. Their thumbs were still up, showing that everything was fine. Finally, I reached the landing at the top of the stairs, where my curiosity and fear were teetering dangerously, and I felt strong urge to escape. As I strained my eyes in the darkness, I began to entertain the thought that something might be standing in front of the door. This kind of what if thinking was taking over. Crack, crack, crack. The sounds grew more intense, and I started to feel like I was stepping on something again. I can't say how many times I turned around. Their thumbs remained firmly up. Then, when I finally reached the door at the top of the stairs. An overpowering stench assaulted my nose. I reacted just like B. <coughs> It was an incredibly foul odor, a mix of rotting garbage and sewage. My mind raced. What is this? What is this? I searched the area, still feeling the sensation of dread. That's when I saw it. Piled up in the corner of the landing at the top of the stairs was a massive heap of discarded food. The source of the terrible smell. Flies were buzzing around it frenetically, and then, in my semi-panic state, I noticed something else. At the end of the second floor hallway, there was a door frame made of what looked like plywood, and it was covered in countless nails. On top of that, there were a large number of paper tassels affixed to it. Furthermore, some kind of long rope was woven around the nails, creating a spider's web-like pattern. Honestly, it was the first time I had ever seen those paper tassels, so I can't say for sure that they were tassels. But I don't think they could be a large number of stickers. It was clear that something was being sealed away here. That's when I realized my actions had been a mistake. Let's go back. I made a move to turn around, when suddenly from behind me. A sound like something scraping or clawing came from behind the door, and then an irregular, unsettling breathing noise followed. At that moment, I felt like my heart had stopped. Is someone there? Who? Who is it? 
I feel like I was playing a role in a horror movie far exceeding what would be expected from a mere bystander. I couldn't move forward or turn back. I was frozen in place. My eyes darted around wildly, and my back was drenched in cold sweat. During this time, The sounds continued, and my legs stiffened with tension were desperate to move. Then suddenly, the sound behind me stopped, and everything went silent for a split second, a silence so brief you wouldn't even have time to blink. Then a loud BANG, followed by the return of the scratching sounds, but this time it was coming from the right above my head, from the ceiling. My legs began to tremble uncontrollably, and I felt powerless. I thought my heart might stop. Who? Who is it? At that moment, I couldn't imagine having the courage to move forward or to turn around. I was stuck, immobilized, with only my eyeballs moving, scanning my surroundings in terror. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw something move. I was terrified of anything moving at the moment, but my curiosity overcame my fear. I gathered the courage to look. And it was A and B. With their frantic hand gestures and calls from below, they were beckoning me. At that moment, I heard their voices for the first time since the ordeal began. Hey, come down quickly! Are you okay? I felt a sudden rush of freedom, and it seemed like my body was no longer under the control of fear. I dashed down the stairs, and later A and B told me that I descended while skipping a step, moving at an incredible speed. When I reached them, I passed by without stopping, running straight into a room. I don't remember much after that. Fear had clouded my memory. After a while, Anne B returned to the room. Hey, are you okay? What happened up there? Did you see something? I couldn't answer. I couldn't bring myself to remember the sounds, and I was afraid to recall them. Then A, with a concerned expression, asked a strange question. Hey, what were you eating up there? Confused, I asked for a clarification. You were squatting right after you went upstairs. B and I were looking closely, wondering what you were doing. You seemed to be desperately eating something, or rather stuffing it in your mouth. Yeah, and furthermore, A and B both stared at my chest. As I examined my chest, I noticed a large amount of filth sticking to my clothes. It emitted a disgusting, rotting smell. My clothes were soiled with remnants of a foul meal. I rushed to the bathroom and vomited everything from my stomach. I couldn't understand what had happened. I remembered going upstairs and vividly recalled the terrifying experience, but I never once squatted down. Let alone stuffed my face with a putrid meal, I couldn't have. However, my clothes were stained with rotting leftovers, and upon closer inspection, my hands also bore marks as if I had grabbed something. I felt like I was on the verge of losing my sanity. A and B, who had come to check on me, were visibly concerned. Can you tell us what happened? You seem really shaken. Yeah, we are worried about you. I shared every detail of what had happened, from the sounds I heard to the nauseating smell, and the eerie discoveries I made on the landing. Despite the stark contrast between the version of events I had witnessed and the one A and B described, they listened attentively to my entire story. Their willingness to hear me out, even when our experiences didn't match, brought me a sense of relief, and I felt like crying. After a while, I noticed a stinging sensation in my legs. Upon examination, I found numerous small cuts on my feet and knees. I wondered about this strange occurrence and noticed tiny plastic fragments scattered here and there. Some were red, and some had a slightly dark and white color. B picked up one of the fragments, examined, and suddenly tossed it to the floor. What's that? What's wrong? Tell us. It's. It looks like a nail. 
Someone's nail. In an instant, all three of us were frozen. A, B, and I exchanged worried glances, an unspoken realization sinking in. I knew it, even though I couldn't explain why. The sounds I had heard earlier, those scratches and scrapes, were the work of nails. And those nails were frantically clawing at something on the other side of the door. But now, they were right above me. My legs began to tremble uncontrollably, and a cold dread washed over me, and I felt shiver run down my spine. I couldn't stay here any longer. I turned to A and B and spoke. I can't continue working here. I understand. I've been thinking the same thing. Tomorrow, I'll talk to Makiko. You're gonna tell her. Are you really gonna say you went up there? No, I won't tell her about that. I'll just say I'm quitting. That might be for the best. That night, we packed our belongings, and feeling embarrassed about it even though we were a man, we squeezed three stones together and tried to sleep. Despite none of us making a sound, we were too terrified to produce snores. But it didn't matter. What we had experienced was beyond worse. The next morning, we awoke, our bodies aching from the uncomfortable sleep. Determined to leave, I went to Makiko to tender my resignation, and her skeptical look confirmed that something strange had happened. But I kept my mouth shut about the horrors of the second floor. As we left that eerie inn behind, we knew we were leaving a host of unanswered questions behind us as well.